Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I'm here today on this beautiful Friday morning with my awesome dermatology and pathology residents and Dermpath fellows. And we're going to have a big mega review session with old school glass slides. And these are totally random, pulled from my, my unsorted study set uh, box. And um, uh, so the, the residents and fellows have not had a chance to preview them, nor have I. So we'll see how it goes. All right. Does anyone know what this thing is? Or ideas, differentials? That is an excellent thought. And it does look quite pink. And then in other areas, though, it looks a little different. So like right here, it really looks like smooth muscle and vessels inside, right? So angiolimioma. But then over here, we get a little bit different uh, pattern. So any thoughts on what you'd do with this area? If I just had the previous area I showed you, I think that's exactly what I'd call it. I have a slightly different view with this, but there's, uh, there's a lot of morphologic overlap. See how it looks kind of whirled? You guys see that? There's a, you know, whirling is something you gotta hallucinate a little bit, but there's a whirl, a whirl, a whirl, a whirl. World and swirled, plump, pink, spindle cells. Sometimes they're a little more bluish than this. Sometimes they look more pink, depends on the case. But if you have something that looks vaguely like uh, angiolimioma, but has whirling, kind of swirling pattern, the other thing you should think of is a myopericytoma. So I always kind of conceptually thought of myopericytoma as, as like a spindly form of glomus, but actually that's not, with more recent studies, that's not what it ends up being. They're actually thought currently to be on a spectrum with myofibromas, even though to my eye, they don't really look much like a myofibroma. They look really like an angiolimioma. And so this one is an interesting one because it has areas like this that look quite nice for myopericytoma, but then areas over here that look more like angiolimioma. And I have seen this occasionally before where you have this kind of overlapping tumor. And you know, the thing is, is they're benign. And so it doesn't matter really if you call it angiolimioma or myopericytoma, or you say it's a spindle cell tumor with features of both in, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter because they're both benign and simple excision should usually be curative. So um, not a big deal. And what's interesting both about myopericytomas and angiolimiomas is they often arise um, in association with a large blood vessel. I've seen this multiple times where you get the tumor either arising on the side of a vessel or particularly with myopericytomas inside the vessel. See this? This is a vessel wall out here. That's smooth muscle of the vessel wall. And then here we've got the tumor arising in the midst of it. And see how these are kind of spindle cells bulge into the vessel? That is actually something you see in myofibromas. So that kind of uh, would actually fit with this idea that myopericytomas are kind of linked. But anyway, I guess usually if I see overlapping features between angiolimioma and myopericytoma, I tend to call it myopericytoma. Um, but, uh, but again, you could probably find different people who have different views on that. But either, in either case, they're both pretty kind of cool tumors. But when you get this swirling, whirling pattern, that's what I'd think of. You could also think of a perineurioma here, but since we're inside a vessel and we've got these myoid looking areas and all these big vascular channels, I think myopericytoma is a, a better name for that. All right, what's this? No, no tricks. No black basal. Yeah, it's a basal cell. The reason that this one's uh, kind of interesting is because it, it highlights um, a phenomenon that's in, in process here, that sometimes basils, we all know that basils have um, a cleft around them, which I always had taught was artifactual. Well, it turns out actually there is a, a mucin-filled cleft around a lot of basils in vivo, and they've used confocal microscopy to show that, which when I learned that like shattered my world, I was like, what? How is it true? But there also is probably some degree of artifactual separation. And that's what's happening here is that that cleft has been widened during tissue processing and the basal is kind of falling out away from that. There's also some cystic change in the middle of the basal. We can see that in basal sometimes. But this space here is, is widening and the, the basal is falling away. But note that you can still see here the stroma, the spindly stroma. Uh, uh, Tony Subtil, who's a great uh, heme path, derm path, he mentioned at a meeting once that the stroma of basal looks kind of like chubby neurofibroma cells. I, I hope I'm not 
uh, taking his phrase too far out of context, but he said they look like neurofibromas cells, but more plump. And I thought that's a beautiful um, visual explanation that I had never thought of, and I love it. So I think he's right. The stroma looks a little neurofibroma-esque, often with a little myxoid change. So the reason that this is important to recognize is because, look, sometimes you get a biopsy like this where there's nothing, but there's a little space that looks like a cyst, and then there's some um, there's some of that stroma around it, and you don't see any tumor. So when I see that, first I look around on the other sections, and maybe do a deeper see, is there basal around here? But if you don't see the basal, I would still, with that, I would say this is suggestive of a basal cell that has become detached during processing and fallen out of the section. So even just this alone has such a distinct look that we know there must have been a basal cell there, and for treatment purposes, they should treat this like a basal cell. But um, usually I would say I get lucky and I find an area that has um, some basal still left or a little bit of basal elsewhere on the slide. But it's a nice little trick to know about because it happens from time to time. So. <clears throat> oh, no, that's nice. Cylindroma. Cylindroma, right? It's a blue nodule in the dermis and there's multiple nodules, but and it, it's similar to spiroadenoma and is related to spiroadenoma. They often coexist, but instead of the large blue balls or blue nodules in the dermis that you see in spiroadenoma, here your nodule is made of multiple little nests all packed together with irregular shapes, but kind of squished into each other, molded together. Some people say like puzzle pieces or spots on a giraffe maybe if you like that but they're all squished together they often have dense layer of basement membrane collagen type 4 surrounding the outside of the nests like a thick pink layer and that layer is often like squished between the nodules and then they tend to have these little droplets of basement membrane that are uh, these little round spherules of basement membrane in the midst of the nests too okay and then don't be surprised if you find some areas that look like spiradenoma uh, in the tumor because that's often present. And then you'll see a variable amount of sweat ducts. See, here's a sweat duct right here. But honestly, this is such a uh, recognizable tumor once you know what it is that you don't even need to go looking for the ducts. You see it from low power and you know cylindrum. See if we can make this work. It might work. Yeah. So no epidermis, right? It's not fair. This is supposed to be derm path session. Well, when we have a nodule with no epidermis on it, and we may have nothing around it or a little fat around it, it means we're in the subcutis, right? Is if it's something that came from a, you know, a, an outpatient clinic, no one, you know, if you, if you can get it out without anything attached or with a little fat attached, that means it's probably a subcutaneous based nodule or deep dermal nodule that's pushed in the subcutis. Um, you know, if it's deeper than that, you're gonna have some muscle with it or something. So any ideas for what to do with this thing? This is a little hard because the, the lighting on these is always hard to get and also slides uh, fade very quickly with this. But see the background is pale blue. Is that coming across? Can you see that a little bit? It's mixoid. So mixoid is, is hard um, on light microscope to project because it, it, it washes out and it's hard with the white balancing. So sometimes it, it looks blue, sometimes it looks like white. But basically we've got a nodule that's mixoid or mucin, uh, whichever you like, mucinous mixoid. And then it's got some little bland spindle cells floating in it. No atypia. Some small blood vessels here and there. That, that looks like atypia. It's just a blob of, of the mixoid stuff. So mixoid stains a little differently from case to case, depending on your lab's H&E, how much mixoid's there, how it was fixed. I don't know why, but there's always variability, even on the same case. Sometimes if I repeat an H&E, it'll look darker or lighter than it did the last time. So um, in any case, so we got a nodule in the subcutis or the deep dermis. It's hypocellular and mixoid. And I'm just going to tell you, if I looked around for a while, I didn't see any hypercellular zones. I didn't see any atypia. Got some small blood vessels in it and these small little cells that are either spindled or trying to find a good one. Sometimes they look like little, little bean shaped nuclei. I'm not getting a good, oh, there we go, there we go. 
Try to get it to focus. See like a tiny little bean shape with a little blob of pink cytoplasm, a little belly of cytoplasm on it. So that's the typical cell that we're dealing with here. So any takers? Any other ideas? Myxoma. Yeah, myxoma. Good. So this is a myxoma. And if you have one in the muscle, we call it intramuscular myxoma. That's kind of outside of the realm of derm path. And in the skin, we can call it a cutaneous myxoma or a superficial angiomyxoma is another name because the ones that are superficial tend to have more vessels to them. Uh, I'm still not totally clear if they actually are the same thing um, or if they are two different tumors. I, I kind of feel the latter, that they probably are two different tumors because they seem to present differently and they look a little bit different. But they do both have the key features that they have a myxoid background with very low cellularity and they have these small little bean-shaped or sometimes spindled cells the other thing you can sometimes see in this and in, in kind of a lot of tumors that have a bunch of myxoid background, sometimes you'll see cells that are, are have like vacuoles filled with mucin. And when you see this in like a, in a cell that looks atypical, like in, a, in a, like some sarcomas with myxoid change, we call them pseudolipoblasts. But you can see similar kind of bubbly mucin filled or myxoid filled cells in myxomas also. They just don't have any nuclear atypia. Okay. And then you may have some delicate branchy vessels. Uh, this case, has, yeah, there's a little bit right there. See that? And you don't want to get the get confused and think that that's the, the chicken wire vessels of myxoid liposarcoma. Uh, this tumor otherwise does not look like myxoid liposarcoma, and I've got videos about that if you want to go see. Myxoid liposarcoma almost never occurs in the skin. So, I mean, there have been rare reported cases. I've never seen one, though, in the skin. All right. So the superficially angiomyxomas or cutaneous myxomas, um, they uh, are benign, but they can sometimes recur. They tend to be multinodular. They sometimes have scattered neutrophils in them. That's a nice clue when you see it, but you don't have to have that. They sometimes have entrapped um, adnexal structures, which often have cystic change, like sweat ducts or hair follicles in them. And they can be, in some cases, associated with what syndrome? Connie. Carney syndrome, that's right. Carney syndrome, um, which has a variety of different things that occur in it, and you can go look up the list of all of those. But the uh, Carney syndrome, uh, it has they have cutaneous myxomas as one of the many things that they can have. And in particular, I think of Carney when I see either a patient with multiple myxomas or if the myxoma is located in one of three sites, it tends to be more likely to be associated with Carney's, and that's the ear the eyelid or the nipple. For some reason, it, the myxomas and carnies are more often at, at those uh, sites. So those are times, otherwise if I see a myxoma, I don't really like make a big deal about saying they need to go work up for carnies, but, but uh, in any case, it's good to know about. But they are benign, but they can sometimes recur. The main thing that you wanna know, if you got an older adult and you think it looks like a myxoma, or you know, especially in the extremities of an older adult, the one kind of common sarcoma that can mimic myxoma is called myxofibrosarcoma looks very myxoid and has hypocellular areas sometimes, but it has atypia. It has pleomorphism. Even the lowest grade form of myxofibrosarcoma must have some pleomorphism to recognize to make the diagnosis. And they tend to have bigger, longer vessels rather than these small branchy vessels. But you might, the main thing is I go look for, if I think it's a myxoma, look for any areas of hypercellularity and any areas with pleomorphism or mitotic activity, then be very careful. And the reason myxofibrosarcoma is important to know about uh, for dermpath and dermatologists is because a it's a relatively common sarcoma b it can mimic myxoma in some areas but if you get a big enough sample you'll find atypia and c it um, occurs in the skin or subcutis about 50 percent of the time so it's a tumor that that is uh, reasonably often or it has a fair chance of being encountered by dermatologists so this case had none of those bad features it was just a myxoma Now, this is a cool case. Where are we? Here's the clue. Anyone recognize this? Salivary gland or anything? Yes, a salivary gland. Very good. And in particular, a minor salivary gland. It's a small little lobule and it's got mucin filled, you know, goblet cell type cells. And then 
that's what these uh, these guys are here. This is a mucid build. And then right here, we see salivary ducts, which are double layer of columnar um, uh, cells. And so it kind of is a little bit similar to sweat glands, right? Except that sweat glands don't have mucin filled cells in them. And also the duct of a sweat gland is more like double cuboidal, not double columnar, but depends on where you are in the salivary gland. There can be similarities. So, so it'll look basically if you're, you know, derm path and you've not seen much oral path, you think, you know, if it looks kind of like a sweat gland, but, but weird, think about minor salivary gland if there's mucin filled there. Or if it looks like a sweat gland, but a little weird, think about breast tissue. That's another thing too. Breast tissue, if you have a small, like a little bit of accessory breast tissue in the axilla, it'll look kind of like a weird sweat gland and sweat duct, but not quite right. Pathologists usually are gonna be quicker to recognize that if they've had path training, because they've seen a lot of breast tissue and oral path uh, stuff. So in any case, so we're kind of in the mouth here. If I recall, this was actually a cheek nodule, a deep cheek nodule. And when they took it out, or, or maybe, I'm sorry, it was lip. Um, lip nodule, and so it was kind of deeper down uh, a mass. I think they thought it was a cyst or some sort of tumor, and they removed it, and so they took out some of the muscle of the lip here around it. See, that's another clue where we are, skeletal muscle there. So what is going on here? Is this a tumor or something else? It's weird, isn't it? I think it's quite pretty, though. Look at that pattern. Isn't that wild? Anyone know what's going on? Don't worry, if you're wrong, I'll edit it out. I feel like it's inflammatory more. Inflammatory, good. Yes, it is. It's a inflammatory reactive process, not a neoplasm. But it's so cellular, you could think of a neoplasm. Who, uh, what was the other comment? Yeah, we just got there like some sort of foreign body granuloma or something. Indeed. These are really robust granulomas. That's what's happening. These are, this is an amazing example of when we say palisaded granuloma. That's palisading, right? But this is not one of the palisaded granulomatous disease processes like rheumatoid nodule or anything. But the same process that we've got a, a bunch of histiocytes, which are epithelioid to spindled, pale nuclei, abundant, dense pink uh, cytoplasm, right? And they're lined up around some stuff. And there are some scattered multinucleated giant cells. Look at that whole huge giant cell. All those nuclei all in one cell. And then in the middle, instead of, you know, like in, in a lot of infectious granulomas, in, in a lot of infectious granulomas, I don't know why I have trouble saying that, we'll see like pink necrosis in the middle. But we don't have pink stuff. We have blue stuff here. Looks like almost gooey like mucin. Why would we have like tons of little mucin filled areas? surrounded by granuloma or is it not mucin is it something else is it filler it is so filler in fact very good one other thought you could think is like a ruptured mucosil but ruptured mucosils the mucin doesn't look like it's not this dense and blue and I've ne and I've seen like granulomatous stuff with them but never like this it's always like loose slightly bubbly foamy mucin filled Histiocytes vaguely around a, an area of ruptured, um, ruptured dilated salivary duct, but I've never seen these like incredibly tight, palisaded, foreign body type granulomas like this. I don't know if someone watches this online and said they've seen otherwise, please educate me. But I don't see tons of mucosils. But anyway, so um, yeah, this is filler. And what type of filler? You know, there's a lot of different fillers, and the best way to know is the history. But this is the one filler that I think is pretty recognizable, actually because it looks like something that naturally occurs in our body. Hyaluronic acid. Exactly. It looks blue like myxoid or the type of dermal mucin we see, which is hyaluronic acid. And this is injected hyaluronic acid filler where the patient's body has had a massive granulomatous host response. And I don't know why this patient had this host response. I Someone asked me that they're like, does filler always produce this kind of reaction? My guess is no. I would imagine that many types of filler produce some degree of reaction, but I think the only ones I ever see are the ones where the reaction has become problematic and then it gets removed because it's made a nodule or mass. So I don't have a real sense of like what normal filler result looks like microscopically because people don't go biopsy that, right? So as pathologists, we only get to see what people sample for us. 
So yeah, this person for some reason had a dramatic um, granulomas reaction. And um, I, uh, to my recollection, the, the history of filler was not presented at the time. And only later, you know, with further questioning, it turned out, yeah, they had had some filler injection and it, it migrated a little bit and got a nodule granuloma around it. So it's always kind of satisfying when we find this without the history. We're like, oh, this has been injected filler and go and find the patient history. And so in this case, yeah, this was in you know, hyaluronic acid. And I also thought it's interesting, why does the body respond to hyaluronic acid? We have hyaluronic acid, but I don't understand the whole process, but I'm, I, uh, my thought is that, or I thought someone told me that the hyaluronic acid, is it, is it produced either synthetically or is it, is it bovine? Does it, do any of you guys know, any of you derms know? You can have different options, you can have both. Yeah, but I'm, I'm imagining it's not human based, right? Since, you know, how a how would you extract it from humans but in any yeah. case even though it's the same kind looks like the same stuff that we have in our body since it is made exogenously i'm guessing that sometimes some of the proteins that show up in there uh stimulate our immune system in in undesirable ways so i just thought it was incredible example of foreign body granuloma where we can still see i mean look at that palisade swoon if you don't like that i can't make you happy guys dr gardner i'm pretty sure People are also allergic to, this is not our surgery test recently, but the albumin in oh. Botox, even though it's human derived. Interesting. Um, which is really odd too. I thought, I got it wrong because I was like, well, albumin is like a naturally occurring thing in the body. We like replace albumin all the time. Yeah. Cirrhotic patients, but apparently that's like a known allergen in Botox injections. That's fascinating. Thank you so much for, uh, for educating me about that. The immune system is a, a wild and weird thing. But anyway, I thought I, that's a case that is quite memorable and I thought was really amazing to see. Um, that's a, probably the best filler reaction that I've seen in my career. And I know my dear fellows like to point out that I'm always saying this is the best case ever. And I am guilty of that. But also when I say that, you've got to admit, it's a pretty cool case. It may not be the best ever, but it's good. But um, subtlety is something I've never been known for, so. And I know you're all laughing with your mute buttons on, so that's okay. It's a trichoblastoma. Oh, yeah. Well done. 2X. And even before I had the lighting right there, it finally, it's right now. Um, yes, trichoblastoma. How did you know, Barak? Oh, just the basal-like cells, and it just has the typical pattern. Yeah, it's like just got a look, doesn't it? Appearance. Yeah. It's got a look. The the one thing that really helps me, and so trichoblastoma and trichoepithelioma to me are two tumors that are either exist on a spectrum or are variants of the same thing. Some people say trichoep doesn't exist. They're all just trichoblastomas. To me, it doesn't matter. Benign hair follicle tumor. It's fun to split things out for our nerdiness and um, and for growing scientific knowledge, but for patient care in general, if I get to benign hair follicle tumor and not basal cell carcinoma at a practical level, I'm happy with that. So um, you can feel differently, but that's how I feel. So yeah, one thing that helps me, blue basaloid with this branchy kind of uh, staghorn antler shape kind of look, that always makes me think of hair follicle, although we know basal cells can do that too. But look what we got here. We've got a nodule that's popped out basically with nothing attached to it. So probably it was deep dermis or subcutis, right? Well, basal cells don't grow that way, right? Basal cells almost always either connect directly to the epidermis or an adnexal structure, and they usually start in the superficial dermis or epidermis and then grow down. You can have them grow down to the subcutis, but they're not going to present as a solitary circumscribed nodule deep down. The other thing that helps me is look at the stroma. The stroma around benign hair follicle tumors is tends to be kind of more cellular. It often has more pink collagenous fibrous stuff. It can sometimes have a little myxoid change like a basal cell does, but it doesn't usually have the, the mucin-filled clefts or a myxoid-filled clefts between the stroma and the tumor. So even from here, I can see that the, the stroma comes right up next to the tumor. I'll show you closer in one second. The other thing, and perhaps to me, one of the best things and most helpful when you get it, and I feel like this particularly works for big, deep trichoblastomas and not for the small, superficial trichoaps, which is kind of like how the people who train me were like, basically, if it's small, in the dermis, has some keratin-filled cysts, then they tended to call those trichoaps. If it was bigger, more cellular, deeper, they would call it trichoblastoma. But again, whole textbooks have been written just about hair follicle tumors. So if you're really into how to split that out, go for it. But uh, for me, uh, that's kind of a, a pragmatic, practical approach. But look at the stroma here. You can tell that the stroma around this is not normal dermis or subcutis. 
It is the stroma of this tumor, and it's got an edge, and the edge is right here. It had a plane of section between it and the surrounding tissue, and it popped and pulled right out like a marble when they went to excise it. Like, I think they thought this was a cyst, because, you know, everything's a cyst until it's not. But this is good, and I've got a, another one on my Kiko um, uh, page, my Dermpath directory. I'll have a link down below if you're watching this online. And you go uh, search on that page, Control-F and search or command F for trichoblastoma. And I've got a digital side of one, different pattern than this, but you can still see just like this, it's got this ball of stroma. All the basaloid islands are encased in this ball of cellular stroma and is completely sharply circumscribed and distinct from the surrounding tissue. I find that really useful because basal just, that's not how basal grows, not in my experience. Okay, so then the next thing is look at the stroma. The stroma is wrapped tightly right around the edges with usually no or sometimes very focal rare clefting but usually no clefting and here it's a kind of like more fibrous looking stroma it's just got a look okay and um and it comes right up now why have i not talked about the blue basaloid cells because to me those are actually the least important thing in making the diagnosis of a, of a benign basaloid hair follicle tumor like a trico or trichoblastoma if you go look at the basaloid cells they look a lot like basal cell carcinoma. Yes, people have tried to say the little of this or a little less of that. But in my experience, the stroma and the way that the shape of the nest and the way they interact with the stroma and the way the stroma interacts with the surrounding skin is the most helpful thing to help me recognize benign hair follicle tumors. Okay, then you can look closer. Now, this one actually had a decent bit of mitotic activity scattered in here. But I just didn't think that there was enough atypia to make it something more exotic, like a trichoblastic carcinoma or something like that. Um, there are such things and there is debate over how to identify them. But to me, this was in the range of a benign hair follicle tumor. Somebody might say, well, there's too many mites, it's atypical or whatever. But in any case, you can go read up more on that. There's a lot of controversy about those things. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't get, I don't find, unless it's like frankly, cytologically malignant, like nasty, ugly looking high grade cells, then I'm going to be really worried about it. But otherwise, I don't find like looking at the cytology or counting mitosis or anything like that uh, to be very helpful to discriminate basal cell carcinoma from trichoblastic tumors. Uh, sometimes you can do CK20 and see scattered benign Merkel cells, which tend to be present in more abundance in benign basal blood hair follicle tumors like trico and trichoblastoma and tend to be minimal or absent in basal cell carcinomas. Not a totally perfect test, but of all the immunostain things, I personally find that one the most useful of the ones that I have tried. There are some other newer options out there that I have not really explored yet, but um, yeah, there you go. What was the last thing I was going to say? It was, hmm. oh, papillary mesenchymal bodies. Those tend to be uh, more abundant in the smaller superficial trichoepitheliomas. And I feel like it's hit or miss whether you see them in trichoblastomas. If you find them, awesome. But I don't recall this one having any real good papillary mesenchymal body. So I am not disturbed by, by a trichoblastoma without good papillary mesenchymal bodies, because that's okay. Uh, but I do feel like you see them, but, oh wait, maybe I, told, maybe I lied to you. Maybe I'm confusing this with another case. There's kind of ones here, they're not the best. This like little cluster right here is a very primitive kind of papillary mesenchymal body. And if you guys are like, what? That does not look like one, I agree. It's not the best, but it is kind of like the spectrum of papillary mesenchymal body. But as one of my fellows, Ed Fulton, used to like to say, he's like, I like my papillary mesenchymal bodies with a capital P. Like, I want them to look perfect. So these are like kind of weak ones. But you can go, I've got stuff on the Kiko uh, page about good papillary mesenchymal bodies. All right. So we, we belabored that one, but a real nice try to blast them. I'll try to go faster. You guys know I always say that and I never pull it off. But never give up, right? Hypocellular pink nodule, spindle cells. Here, I'll flip the condenser. That's a little helpful sometimes. Sclerotic fibroma. Very good. Sclerotic fibroma. It's got the swirling, whirling pattern uh, that some people have likened to the wood grain or plywood appearance. And then it's collagen with cracks in between. So these cracks and collagen swirl together with the plywood appearance. I feel like um, you see that sometimes better here if you have a light microscope and you can flip the condenser. It makes three-dimensional things and spaces stand out better. See, so look, without, with it turned on. I think it's better. You can decide what you think. And it's hypocellular bland spindle cells, dense collagen, cracks and swirls, okay? 
Um, the uh, neurofibromas could look like this, tend to be a bit more cellular and not quite as sclerotic. Sometimes it's a little hard on a, a light microscope a projection like this too, to get a feel of like, is the collagen really sclerotic or is it pale because it's got some mixoidy change? So if you struggle with that, yeah, that's the area. And this one's a little bit faded on it, honestly too, or the H&E wasn't as strong. One other thought I would think of is perineurioma because it's a swirling and whirling. So you could easily do perineurial markers. Some perineuriomas can become quite sclerotic and look like this. So that'd be another thing. And then people have suggested that sclerotic fibroma, the plywood pattern is, is actually in a variety of different, uh, different entities can have that similar pattern. So I do think that they are a thing, but there are some times where you see this plywood pattern in dermatic fibromas or perineuriomas or other stuff. So, you know, if I found this, but then at the edge, it looked like dermatic fibroma, I'd probably just call it, oh, it's a DF that's got some sclerotic fibroma pattern in it. But when these are solitary lesions um, uh, they, and don't have any other features or stain for anything else, we call them sclerotic fibromas. They can express CD34, just like a lot of fibroblastic things. And when patients have multiple, they can be associated with what syndrome? How does Cowden syndrome, very good. But you know, when they're solitary, most of the time when I've seen these, they've been solitary um, and no known uh, syndromic association in those patients. But but they were first described as you know Cowden syndrome related fibromas, and then over time people recognized. I think Ron Rapini was one of the early people to recognize that that these um, that these can just be sporadic um, as well. So um, and the other name that some people call them is um, story form collagenoma. And um, I, I sometimes like to call them sclerotic fibroma of Rapini to honor uh, Dr. Rapini, who was uh, a really great um, inspirational mentor to me um, in my pursuit of therapy. Right. Okay, what kind of specimen do we have here? Artery. Yeah, probably from the temporal artery, right? Because that's the main time we get an artery like this. Um, and this is the protocol, right? We cut the artery in multiple cross sections and we embed those on end. And then we cut a lot of deeper levels and step sections to look for giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis, right? Yes. So the first thing you probably notice is there's calcifications in the wall of this vessel. That is a common finding in temporal arteries and in other arteries in older adults. Um, when it's in the muscle, you can call that Monkeyberg's medial calcific stenosis, um, which is, is thought to be related with hypertension. Um, and there's debate over whether it helps cause hypertension or as a result of hypertension, chicken or egg. In any case, common finding. Some people split hairs and say, well, if it's just calcification of the, the internal elastic lamina, which is actually what we see here, that maybe that doesn't represent true Monkeyberg's. Who cares? It's, it's benign incidental calcification which is just something we see a lot. The other thing I'd say that we see here that's abnormal is look at the intima. Normally we've got the, the adventitia, the outer layer of fiber stuff. Then the muscle wall here is the media. Then you get the internal elastic lamina, which you can't see right here. I'll show you in a minute. And then in here, normally you have a thin layer called the intima with the endothelium and then the lumen. But here the lumen's tiny and we've got this kind of mixoidy fibrous spindle cell stuff filling up the vessel loop and squishing the lumen down. That's called intimal um, hyperplasia, and that tends to be uh, the result of chronic hypertension. The, it's a reactive change of the vessel. This is not the same thing as atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis can look a little similar, but has more like foam cells and cholesterol clefts in it, and you can have both together. You know, people tend to have you know, hypertension and high cholesterol and all those things, you know? Um, and so anyway, those are reactive things, but I wanted to point them out because sometimes that's all we see. But here we have something else. We've got the real deal here. Look at all this stuff. These are histiocytes infiltrating the wall of the vessel. There's also been hemorrhage here with hemosiderin. There's some EOs here, which is kind of uh, interesting. We see that occasionally. And there are some, not the best example here, but some giant cells in here. There is better on another uh, section. Oh, there it is. Multinucleated giant cells in the wall of the vessel, and they're usually right around the elastic lamina. So let me see if I can find some intact elastic lamina to show you. I don't know if there's any left here. Ah, there. So the elastic lamina, you can do a um, uh, Virhoff von Giesen elastic stain to highlight it, or if you have a light microscope, 
you can flip your condenser and that little squiggly line right there, see how it stands out? And you can see it go up and down. That's the elastic lamina. And so for some reason in giant cell arteritis, the giant cells and histiocytes and inflammation are attacking right around that layer and that layer gets destroyed. See how it goes along here and then it disappears. It just squiggles out into nothingness and then is replaced by all that inflammation. So that's what's happening. You can see some little fragments left over down here, but it's destroying the elastic lamina. So sometimes after you treat it with steroids, all that's left is a zone with the loss of the elastic lamina and some kind of scarring of the vessel wall. But here we've got a nice active example of giant cell arteritis. I would say that the majority of these biopsies I look at show either nothing or very minimal reactive change and not inflammation. So they're, I find them quite frustrating to look at, to be quite honest. But every once in a while, we get an example like this is totally diagnostic and no hedging is needed. We got giant cells in the wall of the vessel that's giant cell arteritis. But even if I only see a little inflammation, a little histiocytes, any kind of inflammation or histiocytes in the wall of the vessel in that area, I'm going to be right away suspicious and I'm going to look carefully around that area, cut some deeper sections on that area to look because sometimes you can have foci of giant cell arteritis that skip uh, and you know, we'll have an area and then normal vessel, then another area. So that's why we cut the deeper sections to find it, okay? So a lot of times these patients have been treated before we get the biopsy, which is the right approach that, you know, if there's any suspicion, they clinically give them steroids and then send them for temporal artery biopsy. But because of that, sometimes the inflammation gets wiped out by the time we see it, by the time it's removed from the body. Um, some cases, though, even with the steroids, they still have active giant cell arteritis. So that is a really good example. Sometimes you can also see some neutrophils and um, fibrinoid necrosis of the vessel wall. But really, give me one giant cell like that in the vessel wall, and I, that's, to me, good enough in the right clinical setting. These patients usually have headaches, right? They may have jaw pain. They may or may not have some, some temporary vision loss. And that's the real risk if you don't treat it, right, that they can have permanent blindness that develops from it. And then uh, also they will tend to have an elevated um, erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein levels uh, as markers of inflammation. So active, relatively florid in this case, uh, giant cell arteritis, a.k.a. temporal arteritis. Not the best example, but it'll do. Sometimes it's good to see not the best example because that's real life, right? All right. Anyone have a thought for this? This is a thing like once you've seen it a couple of times, you'll like get a, start getting a feel for it. I don't feel great about it, but my first thought was a DF. You're, that's very fair. And some people, in fact, consider this a variant of DF. Although it stains different, it usually looks a little different, and it has different molecular finding. But for a long time, like when I was in training, this was thought to be a variation of DF. And again, some people still kind of hold to that idea. And the cells are like plump, spindled to almost round or epithelioid in some areas. And this one is more kind of spindled and angulated. And they've got some pale cytoplasm. And then in the background, there's dense collagen in between them. Is it like fibrous? Cytoma category? Yeah, it's epithelioid fibrous histiocytoma, right. So that's what, a little confusing because that sounds like it's an ep, you know, dermatofibroma's other name is benign fibrous histiocytoma, right? This is, to me, those are identical things. Benign fibrous histiocytoma is dermatofibroma. But epithelioid fibrous histiocytoma um, is actually now thought to represent a, a either a different variation that has a different molecular pathway or just a totally different tumor. I kind of favor the latter because they're usually you have a good bit of difference. This one does look kind of like a DF though. But they tend to be up, up right up in the papillary dermis, a nodule, not every case, but they tend to be like this. They push up, they often get a little collarette around them. This one does not have a collarette, but they often have that. They sometimes have more circumscribed boundaries than this. And um, the cells are like kind of plump and uniform um, with pale nuclei. And then if you do a stain, does anyone know what stain this will be positive for? Alk. Alk 1, exactly. And that's when the when the uh, realization that these are different from the rest of dermatofibroma, benign fibrous histiocytoma came from the fact that these have ALK positivity and ALK gene fusions um, in basically almost all of the cases, a vast majority of cases. So ALK is a beautiful stain on this. And if you're watching at home, I personally find that the clone D5F3, that clone of ALK works really well for this and also for um, uh, Spitz nevi with ALK fusion and, and 
um, other things. So in HemePath, sometimes they use a different clone, but I found that, that I can't remember what their clone is that, that has been used, but I found that clone is often really weak in epithelial FH or in spit stains, um, whereas the D5F3 stains really nicely. So in any case, just be aware of that. But if you think it's a weird looking DF that's kind of got a collarette or kind of circumscribed or more plump cells, keep epithelial FH in mind. It's totally benign. And so that's why it's kind of nice because if it's kind of weird and you're like, I don't know what this is, and then you do the ALK and it's positive, um, and you know, the some of them are more epithelial than this, and you might think of like a melanocytic lesion, so you can do S100 or SOX10 to prove it's negative. And then the you know the ALK is confirmatory. The other thing to know is that these about half the time can express EMA. And so because of that's kind of weird, right? We wouldn't expect the dermatofibroma, a regular one, to have EMA. So when these are more epithelioid than this current case and then have EMA, you might start thinking of other things like epithelioid sarcoma or something else, you know? So um, in any case, just be aware of this little unusual entity. Epithel the other older name for this was epithelioid cell histiocytoma, which maybe is better because that kind of implies that it's something different than a dermatofibroma slash fibrous histiocytoma. But just know this is a thing, and they actually have a much wider range of features than originally described. Sometimes they're very spindle, and I've seen swirly, whirly ones that look kind of like DFSP. I've seen a wider and ever-expanding range of morphology. So just keep it in mind, and if you're thinking about it, try an ALK state. And I've got some more stuff about that on my Kiko um, index. Ooh, now this is fun. That's a big one. Can't even get the whole thing quite on the screen. Okay, there we go. Any any ideas from low power? Thinking angiofibroma was one of them. Wow, master. Yes, you are right. You got it from low power. Very good. This is a lot bigger than the angiofibromas, aka fibrous papules, that we see most of the time, right? Which is why it's in the study set and the countless ones that I see every day are not. So usually we see these like little tiny, tiny white bumps on the nose or elsewhere on the face, but the nose is most common. But sometimes they can become large, pedunculated even polyps. They tend to be more sessile, kind of wide-based polyps uh, but, or papules, but sometimes they can have like a little, look at the little stalk here. Like looks almost like a skin tag, you know? But definitely doesn't look like a skin tag in the middle of it. For one, this was probably on the nose, See, we've got some little hair follicles with sebaceous glands in it, which is also evidence that it's probably not a tag, because tags conventionally are thought to not have adnexal structures in them. Um, and then we see dilated blood vessels, dense collagen background, and kind of plump spindle to stellate cells. Some combination of those three features present in variable amounts and variable patterns. So if you see a spindle cell lesion on the nose, the answer, unless it's floridly, obviously malignant, in which case it's probably a AFX pleomorphic dermal sarcoma spectrum or spindle squame, spindle melanoma. But if it's not obviously malignant, the next top 10 things in your differential for a spindle cell lesion that looks probably benign on the nose of an adult should be angiofibroma, 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 because there are lots of different variations of them and they can look really weird and you can have scattered pleomorphism in them, you can have myxoid change, you can have epidermal induction that has basaloid follicular appearance, um, you can have really dilated vessels, you can have really sclerotic stroma, and all of that. So anyway, just know that that's a, a nice, nice take-home pearl that if you're like, I think this is on the nose and it's a spindly thing with some vessels, the answer is angiofibromas will prove otherwise. Cool? In real life, again, we do have to think of other stuff, but um, here we've got the dilated vessels. There is dense collagen. This one also has a bit of edema. I suspect that's because it's so pedunculated that there's probably some impingement on the, the lymphatic drainage and it's getting some backed up lymphatic drainage with some, a little bit of like localized lymphedema like change in the midst of the angiofibroma. You can see a similar thing in large um, uh, acrocordon uh, skin tags. Uh, where they get kind of twisted on their stalk and they start getting a variety of reactive changes, including edema and dilated lymphatics because the, the lymphatic flow is not is, is uh, compromised by the thin stalk. So here we've got some kind of stellate, star-shaped, triangle-shaped cells that look like reactive myofibroblasts almost. In the more sclerotic areas, this is like more typical, these kind of spindled or stellate, spiky-looking cells sometimes with the like binucleation or trinucleation 
And uh, my program director for fellowship, Doug Parker, said that these reminded him of the little insignia uh, on the Star Trek uniforms in The Next Generation. It's a little kind of swooped uh, thing right there. So that's kind of nice. If you're a Star Trek fan, you'll either, either love this or you'll hate it and say it's blasphemy and this does not look anything like this insignia. So the choice is yours. Uh, but in any case, I like that, that they are kind of, when we say stellate, it means star-shaped, but what we really mean is triangle-shaped. I'm very literal, and I do not think these look like stars. Stars should be like five points, a little drawn out, or six points, but should be very, like, symmetric, and that's not what this looks like to me. So I like, a, you know, pointy, spiky, triangle-shaped. Those are visual words that work for me. But you do you, whatever you like. All right. So there you go. A nice, juicy example of a benign fibrous papule or angiofibroma. If you have multiple of these on the face of a kid, what do they probably have? Tuberous sclerosis. Exactly. The so-called adenoma sebaceum of tuberous sclerosis is actually a double misnomer. It is neither an adenoma nor is it sebaceous. It is just an angiofibroma uh, around uh, where there are multiple on the face of a child. But the vast majority of fibrous papules I see are solitary incidental lesions in adults. And they can, if you have multiple, what is a bird hog debay also can have, right? Um, uh, multiple fibrous papules in adults. Am I saying that correct or did I get it wrong? Yes. Okay. Correct. Always make sure all these syndromes, hard to keep them straight no matter how long you've been doing this. All right. So that's a nice one. Very pretty. Ooh, that's a good one, too. 2x, what's your first thought? The low magnification. X. Yes, very good. But it's good to think of that, that lichen planar pilaris and lupus erythematosus and, to some extent, uh, CCCA, central centrifugal centricial alopecia. In the setting of on the scalp, those can all have some degree of overlapping features, fibrosis and inflammation, and the kind of pattern of those mixed with the clinical can kind of help sort out which one it is. But here we're probably somewhere else not on the scalp, I imagine. I think we're probably on the face here, but it could be the trunk. I might be wrong. And what we've got, the, what's that? The, the character plugging is also, I feel like, very helpful. I don't know if that's significant. You know, yes, like the very good. Yes, that's right. So this is discoid lupus erythematosus. Now, in real life, I find it hard to reliably sort out the different types of lupus just on biopsy. I really feel clinical plays a role there. And occasionally, even other connective tissue diseases can mimic lupus and vice versa. So, so I do think there's some flexibility in subtyping. But this, to me, looks like a good classic, what it's supposed to look like example of discoid lupus. And clinically, this was a lesion of discoid lupus erythematosus. So from low power, I'll tell you what I see. Number one, I see superficial and deep, pretty brisk inflammation that even though we're far away, it looks like it's probably lymphocytes, okay? So peri perivascular, superficial and deep, and periadnexal. We can't really see the vessels well in here. Probably there's some vessel down here and some up here, but there's so many adnexa here, it's hard to tell if the inflammation's around the, the vessels or around the adnexa. But we definitely know there is inflammation around the adnexa too, right? We've got inflammation around the infundibulum of multiple hair follicles and deep around the follicle and around the eccrine coil. So we have superficial and deep, perivascular and periadnexal lymphocytic infiltrate, okay? You may have some plasma cells in it. That's relatively common. You usually don't have very many eosinophils um, in it, okay? So that's it. Superficial and deep, perianexal and perivascular, and also interface alteration at the epidermis in most cases. So that can range from vacuolar interface to lichenoid interface. I'll show you closer in a minute. It can vary from case to case. I think discoid lupus is a good example of how vacuolar interface and lichenoid interface are both types of interface dermatitis that exist on a spectrum microscopically. In the books, we often teach them as like different chapters. And it's true that some diseases are usually vacuolar and not lichenoid and vice versa. But in real life, they exist much more on a spectrum. And I think you should keep an open mind that those two things have overlap. That's my view. And then, like uh, like uh, you said, the plugged, keratin-filled, dilated follicles a great classic finding for discoid lupus in particular. Let's look closer. Here, we see occasional dying keratinocytes, like right here. But really, the interface itself, the basement membrane, looks pretty clean. So there doesn't look like there's much active interface going on here, but there are a couple dying keratinocytes. 
Over here, though, it's a little bit folded, but look, multiple dying keratinocytes. The basal layer is getting a little jagged. To me, that's a sign that we've got some kind of burned out interface where the keratinocytes have died, the basal layer is getting disrupted. You can see it actually even better down here, extending down the hair follicle epithelium. And I find that pretty helpful. When you've got interface in the epidermis and going down a follicle, definitely start thinking about lupus. Sometimes other things can show that. Lichen planus doesn't usually involve the follicles very much, but I've seen examples that did, uh, that fit for lichen planus better clinically and were not lupus. But here, look, we've got apoptotic keratinocytes or cytoid bodies, vacuolar change, a ratty, ragged, disrupted basal layer instead of the nice clean basal layer like we saw over on the right there. This is interface dermatitis involving the hair follicle epithelium, and it's also involving up here the epithelium of the epidermis. There's dying keratinocytes there. And it may have either totally absent burnt out inflammation with zones of like thick basal membrane and scar, or it may be thick and like lichenoid. It can run a range, okay? And then the dilated follicles plugged with keratin. So that's great. Discoid lupus. Very good. And of course, it's got to fit clinically too. And some people find um, CD123 helpful because it highlights clusters of plasma cytoidendritic cells in, in many cases of lupus. I personally find it kind of a challenging stain to interpret, but in any case, for test purposes, know that CD123 clusters is uh, finding that favors lupus. Not just discoid, but lupus erythematosus in general. Okay, what's this? Xanthoma. Yeah, is a xanthoma, and in particular is a special type of xanthoma. In the eyelid. Yes, yeah. it's in the eyelid. Very good. So we call it xanthelasma. Is these little thin, you know, thin plaques that are yellowish on the eyelids. And microscopically, they're made of xanthoma cells, foamy histiocytes, lipid-filled histiocytes. And they usually just have a bunch of foamy histiocytes, sometimes multinucleated, like here, filling up the dermis in either sheets or little clusters or nodules with very minimal inflammation. Okay, so we're not seeing much in the way of lymphocytes or Teuton giant cells or granulomas. We're just seeing the foamy histiocytes. Oh, I lied. Look, there's a little granuloma there. But in any case, it tends to be mostly foam and very little of other cell types, which is how you can help sort it out from other things like xanthogranuloma or, or other processes, okay? And how can we tell that we're in the eyelid even without being told? Well, number one, we've got skeletal muscle here. How do I know it's skeletal muscle? Well, one, you can see striations if you've got a longitudinal section, but if you've got a cross section of it, look where the nuclei are. They're on the outside of each individual fiber. Remember, peripheral, multiple peripheral nuclei, nuclei around a fiber, that's what skeletal muscle does. And then you get, if you look closer, you can see striations sometimes. It's also a little different color. I feel like skeletal muscle is more bright red. See, it's hard. You, I don't really see good striations here uh, because, oh, wait, there they are. you got to be cut in the right plane of section. This one has it, but the rest don't. So you can see um, skeletal muscle anywhere in the face, but of course in the eyelid it tends to be abundant. The other thing I'll tell you that eyelid skin, at least in adults, when I see it biopsy, it almost always has is pigment incontinence. Melanin pigment dropout is like a normal feature of eyelid skin. In At least it's common enough that it is like essentially within the normal range for at least adults. I kind of wonder if that's why people get dark circles under their eye is because of pigment incontinence. I do not have proof for that, but it is so reliable that if I see skeletal muscle, loose edematous dermis, some kind of stellate multinucleated cells in the dermis, see like right here, these little cells, I don't know why, but these kind of kind of stellate or triangle or multinucleated cells, this is not the best example. Maybe that's a better one. They are common in eyelid skin. I don't know why. And then pigment dropout. Those things together, I'm going to tell you it's eyelid skin. And I will be right most of the time. Okay. Xanthelasma. Okay. Uh, from 2X, any takers? The stuff on the bottom piece is just junk um, on the surface of the slide. Dermatofibroma. That is a great thought. And the main differential, this is not dermatofibroma, but that is the main mimic of what we're seeing here. So I'm going to leave that in because, because you said exactly the kind of thing that you should be thinking, especially from 2X. It's kind of wedge shaped, and I feel like I see some pigment. I was thinking about like a cellular blue or like DPN. 
Good. Yes, this is a blue nevus. To me, I would not call this cellular, but there are variable opinions about how much is enough for cellular. This is probably more cellular than most of the blue nevi that you see in sign out, because a lot of times we see little tiny blue nevi in daily during path practice. To me, this is in the range of just a normal blue nevus, but that's because I've seen a lot more blue nevi than you have. So um, and once, once you see some really cellular ones, then you'll be like, oh yeah, that is cellular. They can look pretty scary. But yes, exactly, it's kind of a wedge shape, an upside down triangle, right? Broader at the top, thinner at the bottom. They often track along adnexal structures like hair follicles, just like deep penetrating nevi do, and how to, or deep penetrating melanocytoma. How to sort those two out is a little more complicated than we have time for, but I have a whole video about that. You can go watch it if you like. From low power, I like your point that, that one of you made about could look like DF because at the periphery, it often trickles out and traps collagen, just like a dermatofibroma does. One clue, oh, and dermatofibromas and blue nevi both have pigment, but the pigment is different. In blue nevi, it's melanin, and in dermatofibromas, it's almost always hemocytorin. Now, from here, it's not possible to tell those two apart. So the one clue that helps me the best from low power to favor blue nevus is if there's not much epidermal hyperplasia. Usually, dermatofibromas get epidermal hyperplasia with flattening of the reedy, and blue nevi don't. But look here, this case is an exception. I'd say that's some tabling. Elongated reedy, they're flat at the bottom, yet it's still a blue. So the rules get broken sometimes. But generally, you know, uh, so yeah, I think blue was a, I mean, a DF was a very, very fair thought from low power, especially. Um, and uh, usually the, they, these um, lesions lack overlying epidermal change. So we go closer and we see that there are spindle cells that are kind of in fascicles with dense collagen in the background. The collagen in the background of a blue nevus is almost always denser than the background dermis. There is melanin pigment, which is usually fine, powdery speckled pigment, some of which is in the spindled melanocytes, and some of which is more blobby and, can, uh, and chunky and is in with, within background uh, melanophages. And in this case, there were some scattered cells that were kind of enlarged and hyperchromatic, and that's totally fine. That's this random kind of degenerative atypia that we see in regular nevi. We can also see in blue. I feel like it's pretty subtle here, but some people it might catch their eye and they may say it's kind of like a so-called ancient change in a nevus. What we mean by that is random scattered, enlarged kind of hyperchromatic nuclei with no other features that are worrisome, right? No mitoses or other features. So random occasional atypical cells in an otherwise normal nevus is probably benign. Again, in real life, is a little more complexity than that, but for practical purposes, is usually gonna be benign if everything else looks normal about the nevus, a random enlarged hypochromatic cell in a conventional a regular nevus or in a blue nevus, okay? It's, it's okay to have occasional enlarged cells. I usually do look a little closer um, at blue nevi in older sun damaged adults, just to make sure that I don't see mitotic activity or really wild, you know, more diffuse atypia, because there are some melanomas that can mimic uh, blue nevus. And of course, additional workup can be done um, depending on um, the, the particulars of each individual case. All right. And blue nevi tend to be strongly positive for HMB45, really diffuse strong positivity. I don't usually use HMB45 very often in practice, but this is one setting where it can be particularly helpful. There are others, but I just don't find it a very useful stain. So it's, it's one of the least used melanocytic markers for me personally. Blue nevus. Now, how about this one? Here's the normal dermis here. Sometimes it's helpful to see the, the uh, normal dermis and then the abnormal dermis. Because sometimes dermis is hard to evaluate the collagen and the cellularity unless you have normal to compare it to at the side. With practice, you can recognize it. But even for me, if I get a punch of all abnormal dermis, if it's subtle, it can be take me a few seconds to pick up on it when I first look at the slide, and then I'm like, wait a second, this dermis is kind of weird. But it's a lot more noticeable when you can see the normal collagen pattern and then this. So now what is this? What's going on from 2X? Is this one a dermatofibroma? This is a dermatofibroma. Very good. Very good. Some epithelial induction. Also. Yeah, this has got nice induction over it. Like that last one had a little subtle hyperplasia. And which sometimes DFs just have subtle, but this one's got a lot. Look at the normal epidermis, and then the epidermis gets much longer reedy. Some of them are flattened or blunted at the bottom, but more impressive than that. And, and of course, we have increased pigment, which is the most common thing we see is, is elongated reedy, flattened or blunted or tabled, whatever name you like at the bottom, with increased 
melanin pigment in the keratinocytes. And that's why a lot of dermatic fibromas look brown clinically. But then also we begin to see some basaloid little buds coming off the epidermis with kind of a spindly and myxoidy sort of stroma around them. And this is basically not, this is not basal cell carcinoma. This is benign hair follicle induction. These are little baby immature hair follicle roots that are starting to grow. And for some reason, dermatic fibroma often makes the epidermis over it grow and change in different ways with the epidermal hyperplasia, the pigment, and some cases will get um, variable amounts of hair follicle, hair root development that can mimic basal cells. So if we're on a test, if you think it looks like a basal and there's a DF under it, the answer is no. It's just a dermatic fibroma with benign follicular induction. In real life, I've actually seen a small handful of cases of true basal cell carcinoma arising out of or over a dermatic fibroma. And one of them actually had benign induction and basal cell over a big, huge dermatic fibroma. You can see that I've got that case uh, digital side of it on Kiko. So weird stuff happens, right? Now look, the spindle cells here, this could be a little harder because there's a really dense collagen here. It looks almost scar-like. So some dermatic fibromas are very sclerotic. Some of them are kind of scar-like. The thing that helps me tell that this is not scar even from low power is the epidermal change. Scar usually will have atrophy and loss of the reedy over top of it, whereas DF will be the opposite. But if you just had an area like this, I mean, I wouldn't be able to tell you that's dermatic fibroma. That could be, you know, chronic lymphedema, sclerotic changes, or stasis, or, or the edge of a scar, or something else. In the middle, though, the spindle cells start looking more, you know, classic here. And we've got entrapment of little collagen bundles, little pink collagen bundles, wrapped around by the spindle cells. And the spindle cells can be bland and thin. They can also be plump and a little atypical. The cytology can run the range of features in dermatic fibromas, and you can have very hypocellular sclerotic ones, and then all the way up to really big cellular deep ones. All dermatic fibroma has a huge wide spectrum, okay? That's why I don't, don't go straight to the spindle cells. Look at the pattern from low power, particularly for dermatic fibromas, because the, the least important thing is the cytology of the cells, usually. Um, most important thing is what the epidermis is doing, how it interfaces with the surrounding dermis, how it interfaces with the underlying fat. And usually there's not very much involvement of the fat, but some cases can trap fat a little bit or extend deeply into fat. There's weird exceptions outside the scope of what we're talking about today. So that's kind of a sclerotic example of dermatic fibroma. Uh, this one's a bit hard to do without stains. It would be easier to show with stains. This is nail, right? So it's a biopsy of at the edge of the nail here. The matrix would be kind of like down underneath here, although I think this is probably to the side a little bit. And this was probably for a pigmented streak in the nail, linear um, melanonychia. And then here, it's a little hard again without on um, this case to show, but I, if we did a SOX or a MART, all these cells would be melanocytes. And there are more of them scattered along the basal layer here with occasional pagetoid spread. And they're not super ugly, but they're not normal looking either. They're enlarged. And I think that nail and melanocytic lesions are very challenging to evaluate. I really struggle with these. And I have often sent these to experts uh, uh, to look at because I find them hard. But in this case, in addition to the nail, the uh, next slide shows the skin right next to the nail. And I think it gets a little bit easier here. We've got a lot of pigment, but also look at this. Very atypical junctional melanocytes. All these vacuum, these are all melanocytes in here and they're going down and up the reedy. They're confluent, right? and they're enlarged and atypical. We can even see a junctional mitosis in one of them right here. Sometimes it's hard with junctional mites to know, are they really in a melanocyte or are they in a keratinocyte? But right here, there's so many melanocytes, I think it's probably in a melanocyte and they're very hyperchromatic, right? So they're atypical and they're confluent. So this is acrolytigenous melanoma in situ. And in this case, it had involvement of the nail. But here, this is, this is it extending onto the adjacent skin um, I don't know if this is actually a lateral nail fold or where exactly. I don't, I don't recall this uh, details of this case. So this was an acral melanoma. Thoughts? Bad about DFSP because of the honeycomb, but I don't know that it's that.
Yeah, you're right. There is some fat entrapment there, which is always good to think of DFSP, but it's great to remember a variety of things can entrap fat, but it's good to keep that in mind. The one thing from low power that makes me think maybe not DFSP is how like blue it is. It looks more cellular, but you know, we'll go closer. So it's hard. Sometimes at 2x, I'm, I'm right and I can get a subtle diagnosis and sometimes I'm spectacularly wrong from 2x which is why I don't just have a 2x objective on my scope. Maybe some people are good enough to get them all at 2x, but I usually like to go closer to confirm. But I always try at 2x. It's a great way to train your eye. It's a great way to realize things that can mimic each other that you might not think of otherwise. Okay. So the whole dermis is filled with something. And it's kind of a variety of different somethings in your cells. No, oh, let me try again. It's a little bit washed out. That's better. What kind of cells are we looking at here? Any ideas? Well, I'll tell you this. When I see an infiltrate of cells in the dermis, look, a lot of the dermal collagen is still there. It's kind of altered, but so the cells are kind of filling in the spaces between the collagen. So right away, that makes me think of either hematopoietic process, like a lymphoproliferative process, or an inflammatory process, right? It makes me think of we've got some type of white blood cell because white blood cells are don't stick to each other. They are able to float through the blood, and they're also able to just kind of fill in all the spaces in the tissue without displacing the normal structures, right? See, the normal and nexal structures are still kind of there. It's just everything's filled in around them. So right away, I'd wonder, is this like leukemia cutis or lymphoma, or is this some sort of histiocytic proliferation? And I think about histiocytes, especially because I see a sheet-like proliferation filling the dermis, and there's a lot of pale areas that are gray or pink, which means there's a lot of cytoplasm, and histiocytes tend to have a lot of cytoplasm. So right away, when I see a sheet with pale, gray, pink areas in it, I think we probably have significant population of histiocytes here. This is a mixed population. We have histiocytes, but we also have other cell types too. So most of these pale cells are histiocytes. And if you look around, they most of them have kind of a bubbly, vacuolated cytoplasm. So kind of xanthomatous foam cells, histiocytes that are, are um, have a lot of lipid in their cytoplasm. We also have occasional eosinophils. And the darker small cells here that are just nuclei, those are lymphocytes mostly. There's a mitosis. Well, that's okay. Inflammatory things can have mitosis too. I think the nuclei look pretty bland. It's a little, some of them are kind of large, but they don't look markedly atypical to me. And this was a solitary uh, papule on the face of a child, probably, but I don't know for sure. And there's more EOs. So foamy histiocytes in sheets in the dermis with scattered EOs and some lymphs and a little bit of like spindled fibroblasts and fibrotic collagen in the background. What could we be thinking of? Maybe like granuloma faciali? Yes, that's one thought. The one thing we're missing for G facial is neutrophils. I feel like almost always when I see granuloma facial, we have uh, neutrophils. There will be some histiocytes too, but I feel like we get more neutrophils and lymphs, not quite so many um, Histiocytes, but I like that you thought of that because it fills the dermis just like G facial does. That's a great idea. But usually they'll be like this with scattered little neutrophils all over the place, which is a very unusual pattern of inflammation, I, I feel. Um, so that's a great thought. This is hard because it's missing the one feature that if I showed you, you guys would all be like, oh, easy, no problem. But that's why it's good to see cases like this because in real life, you sometimes you're missing the feature. Is it JX, please? Very good. This is a juvenile xanthogranuloma, aka solitary xanthogranuloma, because they occur in adults sometimes. So I don't know that this was on a kid's face. Classically, this would be a reddish, yellow, brownish papular nodule on the face of a child. But they can also be in adults. And even though the name says solitary, um, they also can be multiple sometimes. So yeah, this is a xanthogranuloma. And sometimes they don't have two-ton giant cells. So I know that's the key. If I showed you the two-ton cell, you guys would be like, oh, Foam cells, EOs, and two-ton giant cells, no problem. But xanthogranulomas have a wide range of features. Sometimes they're histiocyte predominant with little foam. Sometimes they have a bunch of foam. Sometimes they have a lot of lymphocytes. Sometimes they have numerous EOs. Sometimes they have 
just sheets of Teuton giant cells, any of those combinations are fine. Sometimes they become very fibrotic and start looking like dermatofibroma. So if you think it's a DF, but you start seeing EOs in Teuton cells and it's the face of a kid, probably xanthogranuloma. If you think it looks like a xanthoma, but it's got areas with a lot more lymphs and some EOs, probably a xanthogranuloma. So it's a, it's a lesion that can have really a bunch of, a range of different morphologies, depending on how much of each component is present. So it's good to know that you can get ones like this that don't have two tongue giant cells. Little shave with a blister, pustule, there's neutrophils and junk in the middle, some sponge and some dying keratinocytes at the side. Uh, it's a darker skin patient with abundant pigment and some pigment dropout as happens. There's inflammation in dark skin types. Some sponge. What's going on here? I first saw with like a blister and a necrotic keratinocyte. It's like, well, I guess all the new. Um, anyway, so I was thinking like EM, SJS spectrum, but for sure. That's good to think of because you definitely. Well, I hope it's it's herpes, herpes yes. Yeah. It's But I'm so glad you said, uh, what about, could it be erythema multiforme, SJS spectrum? I didn't give you any clinical here, which is unfair. So this was on the penis, and it was painful, uh, blisters with erythema and, and erosion and ulceration, right? So, but you are right, and I think it's a great point that if you don't know about this, if all you learn about herpes is what herpes cytopathic effect looks like, you're going to miss some herpes because sometimes the cytopathic effect is very focal or even absent on a given section. And what you might have is an ulcer with dirty necrosis and neutrophils in the base. And you may not see a blister. Other times you'll have a blister with acanthalysis, detached floating keratinocytes, but you won't see good herpes change. Sometimes you won't even see the blister and you'll just see the skin next door to the blister, which often has kind of a lichenoid inflammatory response with dying keratinocytes. I've seen one that originally I thought was going to be a lichenoid dermatitis, and then I cut deeper and there was a herpes blister. Also, if you get a deep enough biopsy, you'll see there's usually brisk perivascular superficial and deep lymphocytic infiltrate because herpes involves you know, the deep nerves and stuff. So it, it makes the whole dermis unhappy uh, when, it, when it's activated. So it's not just the involvement of the epidermis here. All these other things are good to know so that you don't miss herpes. So in this case, we have multinucleation, uh, not great molding, and we've got a bit of that smudgy, uh, pale kind of nuclear chromatin, but admittedly, this is not like the most textbook perfect image. And then we have acanthalysis, and what I mean by that is free-floating cells that are rounded up. The keratinocytes are detached and are rounded up. So anytime I see a blister with acanthalysis, with newts, with dirty necrosis, I start, start looking for herpes. And of course, your clinical suspicion is important too. And in difficult cases, you can do immunostains if needed. This case actually was uh, HSV2 um, by, uh, by the PCR swap, I believe. So herpes. And with that, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, guys. And if you're at home, thanks for watching. Look, we did uh, 18 cases in an hour and 20 minutes. That's not too bad for me. All right, guys, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. You're welcome.